previously on Funny Science Fiction. <laughs> this is a this is a donkey safe environment. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Keith from Voltron, saying hello and welcome to the Funny Science Fiction Podcast. Podcast where we talk a lot, a lot, and yet you learn nothing. Our show today is brought to you by our charity sponsor, the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund. Imagine the comfort you'll give Red Shirt Crewman number nine. He'll know that when he puts on that red shirt and gets slain on Miranda, by reefers in 18 minutes into episode 42, that he did not leave his family destitute and without hope. Because of the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund has his back and his one good kitten. Our guest today is Neil Ross. Thanks for being here today, Neil. Oh, my pleasure, guys. Thanks for inviting me. And I too, I believe, have one functioning kidney, so I should fit right in. <laughs> if All I right. suddenly go, and you'll know that it's not working anymore. <laughs> we are down to no functioning kidneys. All right. Yeah. An amazing and longtime voice actor from such movies as Transformers and American Tale, Back to the Future 2. He's also done animated series such as G.I. Joe, Voltron, and many others. In fact, Neil has over 270 acting credits on his resume. Now, for those of you who don't already know, uh, in addition to being a top tier vocal actor, Neil is an author. Now, he wrote a book about his experiences being born in London and post-World War II era um, England, moving to Canada, then to California, and growing into his career. And as you can see here in the picture, his book is entitled Vocal Recall. Now, I looked over your book, and I, I kind of skimmed through a few chapters here and there, and I was looking for, through one. But the one that immediately caught my attention, and the one that I, I, I knew instantly that you and I had to talk about this, and I'm okay with pretending like Nick's not even here, he's not even on the screen, um, is chapter 22. And that chapter is called Backstage with the Lizard King. Because mm. now, first off, holy crap, Jim Morrison. Yeah. Uh, I'm a huge Doors fan, honestly. Uh, I grew up listening to their music, me and my friends singing, and I have so many cool teenage memories surrounding the music of the Doors. And I've always been kind of fascinated by by Jim Morrison, um, you know, and the anagram of Mojo Rising and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but my question for you is thinking about that and you being backstage with Jim Morrison, you talked about sitting next to him. How nervous were you to sit next to and talk with Jim Morrison? Because in the book, you just simply said the entire room was intimidated. Yes. Well, you got to remember, this was uh, many years ago when dinosaurs still roamed the earth. And there was really no rock and roll journalism to speak of. You know, there was uh, Tiger Beat magazine, you know, but uh, Rolling Stone had only just started publishing like a year, I, I think, before this happened. And they had yet to do an article, <clears throat> excuse me, on the doors. So we really didn't know anything about them other than these four sinister faces looking at us out of an album cover. And of course, the songs and the lyrics. And then the person that we were working with to bring the band, I was in Honolulu at the time we left that art. I was working for a radio station in Honolulu. I was a disc jockey in those days. And the person we were working with to bring the doors to Honolulu didn't want to do it. Uh, she said, uh, I can't uh, guarantee what will happen. This Morrison is a maniac and the band's on drugs and, you know, the, it could be a total fiasco. You know, why don't we go with Donny Osmond? Nah, he wasn't around then, but she, she was su suggesting inappropriate people. And we just stuck to our guns and said, we want the doors because they were red hot at that point. This was well, sure. the summer of 1968. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So she essentially said, let it be on your heads. And I want you backstage to deal with these guys if there's problems. And we said, oh, don't worry about it. And then the guy who ran the venue, the, which was in those days known as the Honolulu International Center, it's now called the Blaisdell Arena, uh, he suddenly said, uh, well, uh, there's not going to be any alcohol or drugs backstage. I'll shut the show down if that happens, you know. And so we're thinking, God, we can't, you know, welcome these guys to Hawaii without at least offering them a beer. <laughs> so we, we went out and we got a... a uh, a case of beer 
and I'm spacing what I remember what the beer was. And there's there's a there's a Doors documentary where you you actually see a, a brief back post backstage scene, and 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 it is the the the, the beer that I reference in in the book is uh, sitting on a table. Yeah, it'll it'll come to me. But anyway, we we put this case of beer in this uh, huge cardboard box, <clears throat> which we taped up. And then we wrote in huge letters, uh, fragile electronic equipment, do not <laughs> open. <laughs> and, uh, and we trucked that backstage and we got away with that. But anyway, this is a long-winded answer to your question. I love we it. Were, we were kind of scared, you know, because we really didn't know anything about these guys other than this stuff we'd been told. And um, so we, uh, you know, I remember talking to one of the other DJs and I said, what do we do if they come in and start tying off and shooting up? I mean, do we s uh, tackle them or, <laughs> you know, he said, I don't know. We'll deal. Anyway, they showed up, came in. And it was a large, uh, it was really, a, they did a lot of sports stuff. So backstage was lockers and a training table and a mirror. And as they came in the room, they all went in opposite directions. Like they wanted to get as far away from each other as possible. And uh, various DJs peeled off and started talking to various doors in one corner or another. Jim hopped up on this training table with a mirror behind it and nobody wanted to, seemed to want to deal with him. And I thought, well, I guess it's up to me. So I leapt up on the training table and I, he looked at me and I smiled at him and I said, Jim, would you care for a beer? And that was the magic uh, phrase. Apparently, he, this dazzling smile happened. You don't see him smile often in, on film. And uh, he said, I would love a beer. And I said, well, I think I can accommodate you. Dove under the training table, ripped open the cardboard box, peeled off a couple of beers, handed him one. I took the other, offered him a cigarette, which I, silly me, I was doing in those days. I said, would you care for a Marlboro? He says, yes. So he takes a cigarette. I take a cigarette. We light up. We take swigs of beer. And life is good. And it went on from there. And he was, what I found him to be was a very calm, quiet, sensible, intelligent uh, guy, nothing like the maniac that you read about. And I think a lot of it had to do with how much booze he got in him. I think, I don't know if you've ever uh, encountered somebody like this, but th they're perfectly charming. They have a drink and they get even charm and they have another, they get even, and they get to about the fifth or sixth drink and they suddenly turn into a werewolf. Yeah, they have a, a switch that flips. And yeah, and I think he was like that. And when I encountered him, he didn't get to that fifth or sixth drink. We had a couple gotcha. of beers, and I guess he'd had no booze on the plane. He appeared completely sober. And as I said, very intelligent and kind of soft-spoken, maybe even shy. I don't know. Well, that's cool. Yeah. So, you know, one of the other things I know, I, meant, I noticed, rather, in that uh, chapter um, and in some interviews that you had mentioned this, this story about uh, in other interviews, you said that there was a specific documentary that you felt captured the essence of The Doors and that what they, they did it right. So what was it about the BBC's The Doors Are Open that set it apart from other documentaries or live concert footage that you saw? Well, it was re recorded very shortly after I met the band in Honolulu. And when they played a, a relatively small venue in England, uh, and it's in black and white, and the first third of it is kind of screwed up because, I don't know, somebody got creative and edited in footage of demonstrations of, about what I don't know. It had nothing to do with the concert, but eventually about a third of the way in, they settle down and they just, you just see the band. And that's the way I remember them. Um, I mean, it, it, it's just that that was them in okay. Honolulu in 1968, only it's a few months later and it's in London. But again, it, it, it comes the closest to any performance I've ever seen by that, that band on film or tape or whatever to what I witnessed. 
Okay, fair enough. So it's almost like a screenshot of where you were and what you were doing. So, yeah, yeah, just okay. a few months later. So I mean, yeah. he, they all looked the same, the, sounded the same. I mean, that, that's the show that I saw in essence. Oh, very good. You know, that's uh, one of the reasons why I like. Uh, there's a my favorite band actually is is Pearl Jam, and uh, huge Eddie Vedder fan. And one of my favorite things, videos from them is the live on two legs video, because it was filmed in New York a couple months after I had seen them in Detroit, Michigan. Um, and so the set list is very similar. The, mm -hmm. you know, the, the look of the band is all very similar. So I can appreciate that very much. So let's talk a little bit more about your book here, uh, because there's a ton of narrated document, not documentary, in my opinion, it's almost like a memoir. Uh, there's so much in here about your career, the jobs you've had, the process of doing them, and, and all these things. Now, with all those details that you've included, some might not think it's possible, but I'm guessing that there's a story you didn't include in the book. What could you have possibly left out? Oh, uh, you know, the, as it is, the book is embarrassingly long. I mean, if you <laughs> even if you don't get around to reading it, it makes a hell of a doorstop. Uh, <laughs> But I do so suggest I, that people do read it. It's honestly, it's very cool. Uh, I very much enjoyed the copy that you sent me. Thank you. Oh, you're more than welcome. But yeah, I I threw out a lot of stuff. I got I had to get kind of uh, ruthless at the end. And uh, oh, interviewing Liberace in Honolulu uh, that didn't make the cut because I felt like, gosh, it's so long ago. Does anybody under the age of 50 even know who Liberace was? And then I had an amazing uh, experience with the character actress Kathleen Freeman. I don't know if you're familiar with her. I know you've seen her face. She kind of plays cr played crazy old ladies in tennis shoes type parts in movies. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, sh uh, I can elaborate on either one of those but th th those are a couple that pop into my head that uh, sadly did not make the final cut okay uh, the whole time you're talking about liberace all i could think of is bugs bunny going i wish my brother george was here yeah so. <laughs> see that's the only reference you have when i was growing up he was ubiquitous it was yeah, quite was astonishing everywhere. yeah yeah but by the time that i you know because growing up uh, I was born in 76, so, you know, uh, early to mid 80s, uh, when I started seeing that reference from, you know, Bugs Bunny and everything, um, I think he was more of a, a caricature at that point yeah. uh, in, in life, uh, not the over the top uh, piano player. And, you know, if you take away all the the flash and the, the glam around him, you know, if you look at just his, his body of work, Liberace was a phenomenal, phenomenal piano player, mm -hmm. very skilled. But yeah, he he uh, he was a very interesting person, I think, and and managed to sort of thread the needle in a very strange time. I mean, uh, he's he's a very interesting character. So speaking of uh, your book, writing isn't really for everyone, and some people like the writing process, some people don't like it. And uh, what did you enjoy about the writing process? Why or why not? Huh, almost nothing. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I've always had a facility for putting words down on the printed page, but it's such hard work and I'm so lazy. Uh, mm -hmm. This book started out as a monologue and got out of hand. And the only way I got through it, I was very indulgent. You know, you read most authors, you read, well, they carve out like a three or four hour period in the day and that's when they write and I don't care if my mother's dying or the world is ending. Don't disturb me. I'm writing. And I didn't do any of that. Right. I would, well, essentially, I, I conned myself into writing this book because I couldn't, I couldn't even conceive of writing a book. So I said, you're not writing a book. You're just writing this chapter. And maybe that's all that'll happen. But just we're just writing a chapter. <laughs> So what I would do is I would think about the chapter as I went about my daily life. You know, if I'm exercising or whatever, I'm running phrases through my mind. How do I want to explain this? How do I? And when I sort of reached critical mass, I would dive at the keyboard and start typing like a maniac trying to get it all down before <laughs> I forgot it. 
And then maybe two weeks would go by before anything else happened. It took me a year to, to write this thing. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I was about uh, three quarters of the way through that I finally admitted to myself, God, this could be a book. Maybe I'm going to go all, maybe I'm going to go the distance. So, so with a resume that has over 270 acting credits across movies, video games, animated series, I kind of imagine that sometimes like the scripts and plot lines of characters like start blending together. So I won't ask anything specific about that, but is there a job that you remember doing thinking, man, this is just great. I'm so glad I can be a part of this. Yeah, I think probably the most fun I had was on a show called Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I did this newsman named Whitley White. And I just I had, it was beautifully written. And he, he, he is the only broadcaster, apparently, in this fictional little town of San Zucchini, where the action happens, <laughs> to the point that he will be in the main studio on television, and he will throw it to himself in the field. So, and, and with more on the story, reporting live from the scene, here's Whitley White. Thank you, Whitley. You know, just sur surrealistic stuff like that. And I sort of patterned him after this Southern California broadcaster who was madly in love with the sound of his voice. And uh, I just, I, I would be this close to cracking up as I did his speeches. I mean, virtually anything you hear in that show, I'm this close to losing it. And it was also a lovely cast. Uh, I, you know, basically every show I've worked with has been wonderful people, but this was a really nice mix. Maurice LaMarche was in it. And John Astin, uh, famous for oh, yeah. uh, Gomez and the original yeah. uh, Adams Family on television. Oh. And uh, a lovely lady named Kath Susi and uh, a guy named Scott Bullock and uh, Gosh, there's a couple more, and they'll be mad at me that I left them out. But it was just a lovely mix of people. Everybody was was very charming, and we just had a lot of fun. And, um, it, you know, it's not a show that many people remember, unfortunately, but I had fun, you know, so. I, I do remember it as a kid, and I'm now mm -hmm. thinking, like, I need to go back and binge watch that show now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I I should actually, I'm sure it's somewhere and I should look at it. I haven't seen it in years. Right. And I, I don't know what the hell I'd think of it at this point. As I, as I say, I, I just, I had fun on that one. I looked forward to those sessions. Nice. I look forward to all the sessions. I mean, I'm such a lucky guy. I mean, as I say in the book, I spent my entire adult life doing what I wanted to do, you know, uh, Rather yeah. than, oh, God, it's Monday, I got to go back to that place again. You know, this was, I can't wait to go. This is going to be great. You know, for 20 years, I loved radio. Uh, I began to fall out of love with radio toward the end of that time. But then here came along came this wonderful business called voiceovers, which was even more fun and exciting than radio had ever been. And that's my whole life. Hmm. You know? Other than a, a, a year or so uh, washing dishes when I was a teenager, <laughs> I, I've gotten to have have fun at work my whole life. Nice. And that, you know, most people don't have that. No, I would say you're lucky in that regard. Yeah. You mentioned that you enjoyed every single one of your jobs that you had had. But was there ever one that, like, just got away and you were like, oh, I really wanted that one, but oh, well. Yeah, I remember a couple of instances like that, but uh, you know, you just you just have to kind of suck it up and move on. And um, it, that was the lovely thing about voiceovers in those days. Nobody got that distraught about losing a job because they were almost they were like buses. You know, <laughs> if you if you miss that bus, well, there's another one coming in a couple of minutes. You know, don't worry. Right. Yeah. It. So fair enough. You know, unfortunately, that's not the case today, but back then it kind of was. Mm -hmm. So although you technically got your start as a DJ on air, um, like as a radio personality, I think it's safe to say that you actually got your start as a young man listening to your radio. So like yes. what voices or voice stood out to you 
that came over the radio and like which ones were your favorite to try and imitate? Oh, it's so long ago. The, the, the interesting part of it is at a very young age, we didn't have a television set for a long time until I was about 12. So my formative years, it was uh, the little record player I had and a few records, but it was mostly the radio. Mm -hmm. And the music they were playing in those days did nothing for me. So I would tune around listening for people talking. And I would listen to people talking, even if I didn't really understand what they were talking about. And I began to find myself fascinated by all the different voices that I was hearing coming out of the radio and all the different accents. And then spontaneously, I started trying to reproduce them without any thought of, oh, this will be my life's work. It just was almost like a hobby or a strange compulsion you know you hear a german person talking on the radio and then you want to try to imitate what you are hearing and just, so you just do that in your room and your father goes my kid is weird he sits in his room and talks to himself why doesn't he play ball and uh yeah it it it, it was it, it was as i say it was just almost like a compulsion and uh then I would end up years later using some of that, that stuff. And I can't, you know, I cannot recall any specific uh, voices. It's anything unusual. Your guy you talked sounded like this. It was fascinating to me. How, is, how does that happen? Right. You know? Yeah, I get that. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So, you know, if we look over the last uh, couple decades, uh, animation and video games have exploded since the 80s. And that's requiring more and more vocal actors to portray all these roles. Uh, and particularly, we think about video games right now and, and how much uh, they're trying to pack in storylines and, and everything. And this requires voice actors. Uh, now, is there a show out now or maybe even a video game that you, or you've watched, you've listened to and said, man, that would be a fun character's voice to do? Hmm. You know, I, I got to make a... Uh confession here even though i've been in quite a few of them uh i have never actually played any of these games <laughs> i the didn't tell you I, I wasn't sure if you were sitting down playing call of duty you know but yeah well what the only the closest i came was my daughter uh became fascinated by um uh, the curse of monkey island which is so long ago you guys probably never okay. even heard of it and I had a small part in that. And she she would try to play that and get frustrated. And I would try to help her. And I wasn't any good at it. Uh, I finally found a book somewhere in a computer store that gave you some hints. And I said, here, oh, yes. here's a book. This will get you through it. But no, somebody sent me. A, a, they used to do this. They used to send you copies of these, these games if you worked on them. And somebody sent me one. And I thought, well, I'll, let me see how I did in this one. And I'll... So I loaded it on the computer and I couldn't figure out what to do. And I'm clicking and mousing and suddenly psh, oh, the computer completely crashes. Oh. <laughs> and I had to call a tech in and 200 bucks later, he said, you know, these games, they tend to crash computer. You should have a separate computer for games. I said, how about I just don't play these anymore? Would that work? <laughs> he said, no, nah, yeah, that would work. I said, good. Well, <laughs> So I never tried again. So I've never, you know, once in a while, somebody will put a, a little piece of a game on YouTube and I'll run across it and I'll hear something I did. But uh, no, I've never played any of these games at all. Okay, that's fair. And, yeah. And uh, no, I, you know, I, and I don't tend to try to watch anything I do. I mean, you've worked on it. It's over. It's, you know, I'll, I want to watch somebody else's show. Mm -hmm. You know? yeah, I get that. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I can only listen to my own voice so many times when we're doing the playbacks of these and doing editing and, and stuff. And, you know, so, yeah. I've never gotten used to listening to my voice. I thought I had. And then I had this. Uh, this is another one that I don't think made it into the book. It's funny. There were so many rewrites. I can't remember what's in and what's out. <laughs> but I, I went to work to do a commercial for a woman that I had worked for quite extensively in the past. And then suddenly for a couple of years, she didn't use me. And suddenly here she is again. And hi, hi, how are you doing? Lovely to see you and all that. 
And then she, I thought she said, here, I'm going to play you this commercial. I want you to match what this guy did. Oh, okay. And she fires it off and it starts. And this voice, this wonderful voice comes out and he's so good. I, thought, I can't match that. Jeez, this guy's, oh man, I'm in trouble. And we get about three lines in and suddenly something popped in my head and I realized, oh my God, that's me. <laughs> and the instant I realized it was me, I hated it. I was oh. like, oh God, oh, oh, I, sh I should have, oh, uh. And I, you know, and I went ahead and I did the commercial and life went on, but it, it, it struck me after all these years, you're still not objective about your own voice. No. You thought it was great till you knew it was you and then you thought it stunk. Yeah. How is this possible? So, yeah. I I understand that to an extent because uh, with having two podcasts and listening to my my own voice, unfortunately, a lot, um, I get to a point where I think I'm I'm ultra critical of how I say things and how I phrase things and and oh man, you weren't empathetic enough on this point or you didn't you didn't say you oh you didn't land that joke on on that one or or something along those lines. And so I think when I hear my own voice. Um, I've gotten to the point where I kind of just gloss over what I say and I, I let Nick uh, kind of pick over my stuff. I listen to everybody else's stuff a little more closely than my own. I was going to say, Tim, I, I think I, I, I hear your voice more than you hear your own voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, it's just, it's very hard to be objective about, you know, about your, and I'm sure it's the same with on camera actors. I'm sure. Oh yeah. I'm sure. Know, they, they look at the finished product and wince. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sure there's a few vain folks out there that like the sound of their own voice or they like the how they look on camera. I'm not one of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, you know, I was thinking too, uh, Neil, you know, we think about back in the days of comic cons, you know, you know, remember when people used to be able to get together and congregate. Um, I'm sure that people would come up and, and try to imitate voices that you've done like Keith or Pidge from Voltron or shipwreck from GI Joe or things like that. You know, did you know how did that make you feel did you enjoy those type of things or were you kind of like oh man he didn't hit that note very well <laughs> that uh, it's funny that really doesn't happen that often oh, that really I can, okay that i can serve yeah no i uh, you know i'm i'm all for people having fun if somebody wants to take a shot at something i've done be be my guest and you know i'm going to be far less critical of them than i am of myself <laughs> It's like my daughter says, there's a little person in your head and he or she is called the critic. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he, he's got this running commentary while you're trying to work of that really sucked. That was no good. Why did you do it that way? You know, <laughs> you, oh, yeah. you have to somehow ignore him or her and plow on. I usually call them a them because there's one on each shoulder going, oh, you did that one really good. And at the same time, the other one's going, no, no, you didn't. That sucked. <laughs> yeah. So, well, cool. Well, so Neil, we're, we're at a point in our, our discussion where what we like to do is we like to uh, have a little quiz with each one of our guests. And we're hoping that you'll oblige. So this did, is a... I was up all night studying, so I should do pretty good. <laughs> so um, what we do is, is, is uh, we run a quiz with each one of our guests. And this today's quiz is about 1980s cartoons. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, I, I seem to recall that era vaguely. I was kind of hoping you might. Yeah. So uh, now uh, there'll be five questions. If you get three or more, so 60%, if you get 60% of the questions, we'll send you one of these red shirt widows and orphans coffee mugs. Okay. Yeah, and on the I back, I must have one. I must the, have one. And on the back, it even has our super cool logo, the funny science. You can podcast. replace this ridiculous thing. Well, so. see, there you go. And uh, if you get 80%, what we'll do is we'll, 80% or more, we'll send you the wow. Custodians of the Cosmos. That's Drayton Allen. Drayton's the, the one who started our funny science fiction uh, Facebook group with now over 100,000 members. And he is uh, the one who started the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund. It's mentioned in that book. Um, those guys, it's based on uh, loosely on Star Trek and the Red Shirts because the custodians there boldly go to clean up after those who boldly just went. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so if you get 60%, we give you a, a coffee mug. If you get 80%, we give you the mug and the book. If you get less than 60%, what's that, Nick? 
a signed copy of the book. Yeah, we'll make we'll make ah. sure that it gets that it gets vandalized for you. Um, and then uh, if you get less than sixty percent, we take a picture of your face and we make a meme out of you and put oh. it in the group. Oh dear. Okay. Are you okay? Well. Are, do you accept those terms? I guess if that's if that's the deal, that's the deal. That's the deal. Okay. Very good. Nick, you want to start us off? All right. So your first question: You've just been told to shut your quiz neck. Should you close your mouth, close the trunk of your car, or close the bread box? Wow. Uh, mouth. Yes. Yes. Correct. That was All right. A, I don't even know what that's from. That was an, an impulsive From Voltron. Answer. <laughs> okay. That was from Voltron. All right. All right. So the first G.I. Joe movie, G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, was released direct to video and on TV in what year? Was it... 1985, 1987, or 1989? Uh, 87, that would have been, I think. Correct. Very good. Two for two. Yeah, because 85, I think we were recording everything, and then 89, we were done. Yeah, okay. Yeah, All right. yeah. 87 it is. I'm on a roll. <laughs> yes, that is too correct. This Transformer is the leader of the Autobots. Starscream? Optimus Prime or Bumblebee? Uh, Optimus Prime. Very good. Has to be. Has to be. Yeah. Three for three. So you have earned yourself a coffee mug. I I got a mug and I'm I'm uh, inching toward the the book, the tome. That's right, the vandalized book. You're getting closer. All right. So this character in American Tale shares his name with a character from Pinocchio. Was it Honest Abe, Honest John, or Cool Hand Luke? Well, come on, guys. That was Honest John. Of That's course. right. That's yeah. right. Four for four. All right. That means you get the book. You got the mug yeah. and the book. This and one's just for funsies now. Yeah, just for funsies. Norman right. Osborn is a successful businessman who becomes one of Spider-Man's worst enemies. Was he the Purple Dragon, Sandman, or the Green Goblin? Oh, please, come on. The Green Goblin. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's one of my best things, I think. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't mention <clears throat> it in, the, in any of the preamble stuff, but you were Norman Osborn in, uh, in Spider-Man. So. Yes, the mid-90s Spider-Man. Yeah. Then I was yeah. Norman Osborn in an earlier incarnation of Spider-Man that was done in the early 80s, but mm -hmm. somebody else did the Green Goblin. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. So very cool. All right. You are and now you win five. a mug. No, I, okay. <laughs> All right. Last question. That was our last question. Oh, you are five oh, that for was? five. Yeah. yeah. God, I aced it. This you may be the it. first time I've ever aced anything. That's right. So... <laughs> But uh, yeah, so what we'll do is uh, uh, post show, I'll, I'll have you stick around for a moment and we'll get your shipping address from you and we'll make sure that we get that sent off, okay? Sounds um, groovy, as we yeah. used to say. Yeah. So Neil, thank you so much for being on the show today. We really appreciate that. Yeah, very oh, much enjoyed this. My yeah. pleasure. Can I throw in a fast uh, plug on the I way out? Say, where can people go to find out more about your work and your book and other stuff? I'm so glad you asked. There's a website devoted entirely to this book. It's uh, cleverly called uh, www.neilbook.com, N-E-I-L-B-O-O-K.com. Uh, the book is also available on Amazon, and uh, it, there's an audio version, and yes, it is on uh, Audible. But there's also a version, an audio version you can purchase at the website. So, did you do your own audio? Uh, yes, I. It was amazingly enough. There was a huge audition. Virtually everyone in the business uh, auditioned for this job, and somehow or other, I won. So yes, I am. I am you edged him out. I am the narrator of my book. <laughs> And I am the captain of my soul and all the rest of that. All that other stuff. Very yeah. cool. Awesome. We will be sure to place those in the description as well so people can find you and all of your other works. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Now, I want to remember, guys, that subscribing mm -hmm. is the single most important thing that you can do to help us and ensure that we get more amazing guests 
like Neil here, and we have funny moments for you to be able to listen to. So please subscribe to the Funny Science Fiction Podcast as you're watching this, and please check out Neil's works. You'll be able to find that in our descriptive links as well. And of course, if you're not happy with the content of our videos, all you have to let, do is let us know. And we'll be sure to post a detailed video of how to get that blue milk that Luke Skywalker was drinking in The Last Jedi. Of course, in a very shallow and vain attempt to win you back over. Thanks again, Neil. Thank very you. much appreciate you being here. Thanks, gents. I had fun. I appreciate right. it. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for watching. On behalf of the rest of the hosts of Funny Science Fiction, we'd like to thank you for listening to this episode. If you'd like to be a guest on one of our future episodes, please contact us by means of our Facebook group, Funny Science Fiction. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram using the handle at Funny Sci-Fi, or you can go to DraytonAllen.com and click the contact me link at the bottom of the page. Thanks again. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Copyright 2020 by Drayton Allen. Original music by Jordan Michaels. Reference to any specific product or entity mentioned in this podcast does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation of or by funny science fiction or its sponsors. The views expressed by guests are their own and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. If you have questions about this disclaimer, please contact us via email at DraytonAllen at DraytonAllen.com.